everyone. Thank you for joining the second webinar in our series on animal-free recombinant antibodies. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, this series is being co-organized by the U.S. National Toxicology Program Interagency Center for the Evaluation of Alternative Toxicolo <laughs> Toxicological Methods, or NICEDM, the European Union Reference Laboratory for Alternatives to Animal Testing, and the PETA International Science Consortium. My name is Catherine Groff. I'm an advisor to the PETA International Science Consortium, and I'll be co-moderating today's webinar with David Allen, who is the president at Integrated Laboratory Systems and principal investigator of their contract supporting NICEDM. We'll have two speakers today who will first be presenting on the scientific and economic benefits of animal-free antibodies. First, we'll hear from Dr. Allison Gray from the University of Nottingham, and then we'll hear from Dr. Jao Barroso of the European Union Reference Laboratory for Alternatives to Animal Testing, or ural FAM, which is a part of the European Commission Joint Research Center that runs experimental facilities for the development and assessment of alternative methods to animal tests. Before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to point out that a recording of this webinar will be posted at the link on the screen shortly after its completion. Information about additional webinars in this series can also be found at this link. There'll be time for questions for both speakers at the end of the second presentation. Everyone is on mute, but you can type questions or comments in the question section within your GoToWebinar toolbar at any time during the presentations. This toolbar should be on the right-hand side of your screen. Speaking first today will be Dr. Allison Gray. Dr. Gray is a molecular biologist from the University of Nottingham in the UK with expertise in antibody production and phage display. She founded the organization Affability to create awareness and improve the availability of non-animal antibody resources. She's an ad hoc member of the Ural FBAM Scientific Advisory Committee, serving as a member of the working group on the scientific validity of non-animal derived antibodies. It's now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Allison. Hello everyone. So today I'm going to talk to you about the scientific benefits of animal friendly affinity reagents or AFAs, otherwise known as non-animal derived antibodies, and that's for the replacement of animal derived antibodies. I'll start by covering traditional antibody generation and issues, then the replacement AFAs, including how the mechanistic princ uh, principles of AFA development mirror nature. I'll discuss their merits, answer the commonly asked question about why they are not already well established and then where you can find them. If I could just take this opportunity to introduce the non-profit organization Affability, AFA being the acronym for Animal Friendly Affinity Reagents. So Affability is striving to replace an, uh, antibody production methods that are animal derived with those that don't require their use. So that's to not only reduce our reliance on animals, but also to encourage better science and positively impact society. Affability does this by using a multi-pronged approach, uh, creating awareness around all aspects of antibody production, challenging the enforcement of Directive 2010-63 on the use of animals and scientific procedures, and by improving accessibility to replacement methods and resources. Mostly, society would be unaware of um, animal use for antibody production or even the use of antibodies in everyday products and services. Um, antibody production has created an affluent $80 billion industry, and they're heavily relied upon by all scientific disciplines. But society is largely unaware of how the industry touches our everyday lives. For example, antibodies are behind many diagnostic tests and therapeutics, substance of abuse testing, anti-doping programs, fertility, food safety, and environmental contamination. So we are likely to have encountered their use without even knowing it. I'll just quickly explain how we get to the use of antibodies in all these different ways. It's done by taking advantage of the natural immune response to a foreign invader that may harm us. This gentleman, for example, very poorly with a serious attack of the man flu. A foreign invader, known as an antigen, enters the body to which the immune system launches an attack, and that includes the generation of antibodies to neutralize it. 
scientists realizing this found that by injecting an antigen of interest for example an environmental contaminant in a water supply or a marker of disease into an animal it would be recognized as foreign and an immune response would be initiated then the animal's antibodies could be extracted for use in future tests the animal is immunized repeatedly to obtain high titers of antibodies specific for the antigen in combination with adjuvants to boost the immune response and blood samples are taken to monitor its progression. Smaller animals are sacrificed to extract an adequate volume of blood or to dissect the spleen, whereas larger animals tend to be used repeatedly for continuous production. The animal's response can vary from mild to severe or localised to systemic, but since the antigen may be novel, the animal's response to the immunisation won't be known in advance. Now the antibody production industry uses around a million animals per year in the EU and that's from mice, rats, rabbits to larger animals, mostly ungulates which are animals with hooves such as goats or horses. But um, the use of animals for antibody production is flawed. There are many articles in the scientific literature that complain about these issues and as scientists, we all know and seem to accept their shortcomings. So there are two types of antibodies derived from animals, and that's polyclonals extracted from the blood and monoclonals extracted from the spleen as B cells. Both have advantages and disadvantages, including practical issues such as the time taken to produce them and cost, uh, polyclonals being the most inexpensive and quick to produce. Uh, polyclonals are enjoyed for their multiple epitope recognition, being that they're extracted from the blood where there are millions of circulating antibodies, many of which will be generated against the target. But monoclonal antibodies isolated from a B cell will only produce identical antibodies against the exact same part of the foreign invader, and so they're thought to be highly specific. For polyclonals, the high number of circulating antibodies, even against the same target, means there's a high potential for cross-reactivity and high background. Then there's the issue of batch-to-batch -batch variability. Even when immunizing with the same antigen in different animals or even using the same animal, there is always a different immune reaction each time, so reproducibility is an issue. Monoclonals supposedly avoid such issues, and reproducibility should be high as long as the clone is available. But what are you reproducing? The scientific literature is littered with reports of non-specificity or off-target recognition. A large multi-center study discovered that this was partly because a third of monoclonals had one or more additional productive binding sites due to mutation or contamination by other B cells or DNA from the fused myeloma during hybridoma production. There are issues with storage and uh, determining the genetic sequence is not usual practice, although this is the best way of assuring reproducibility. Overall, this has a resounding impact in terms of wasted cost, time and resources, estimated at $800 million to the biomedical research community, as well as further repercussions on health. So what are the alternatives? Animal friendly affinity reagents or AFAs are recombinant ways of producing molecules that bind to their target, but they don't come from immunization. We have those which are actually antibodies constructed without using animals that come in a number of different formats. On the left here, B, is the classic immunoglobulin structure or IgG and C to H are different formats such as FAB, the fragment variable region, SCFV, single chain fragment variable or an SCFV with an FC, the fragment constant region that also retain the desired binding function. And then there are non-antibody affinity reagents, otherwise known as scaffolds or mimetics, which, like the framework region of the antibody, have a scaffold that holds the binding region in the correct orientation for binding. Then to turn our genetic constructs, whatever the format, into proteins, we have, for example, phage, yeast or ribosome display.
Antibodies are most commonly expressed using phage display. In fact, Smith and Winter were awarded the Nobel Prize for this technology in 2018. So, how's it done? Well, this is what the known genetic sequence of the binding region of an antibody looks like. An antibody has up to six binding regions known as CDRs or complementarity determining regions, which is a mouthful, shown here in purple. In these areas, the genetic sequence is very diverse or hypervariable. Each antibody is unique because of these hypervariable regions. This sequence here is typical of one of the antibody formats, the SCFV, which was shown in the last slide. In this sequence, two tags have been added on the end there so that the antibody gives a signal that can be detected or visualized. So I've circled the region um, here that corresponds to the genetic sequence above. When this peptide sequence folds into its uh, 3D structure, all the binding regions come together where they all assist in binding to the target. And so this is what an antibody looks like. So here we have the SCFB again, and uh, here is the 3D IgG structure, just for reference. So all of this can be slotted into a phage mid vector using standard molecular biology techniques. Now notice how the antibody sequence and its tags are immediately adjacent to this gene 3, which is in green. This gene 3 will be translated into a phage coat protein, and I'll show you why this is important in just a sec. Now this antibody sequence can either be copied directly from the antibody gene repertoire of uh, multiple human donor circulating B cells, in which case all the binding uh, region diversity of the natural immune system is captured, or it can be created synthetically. When the antibody is created synthetically, it's usually copied from known germline antibody sequences, and the binding regions are shuffled or, um, or randomized, which in principle is very much like the process of combinatorial diversification that happens in nature, where the binding regions are shuffled to um, create millions of antibodies. So the antibodies are all um, having a fixed framework region, which is shown in red, but with unique binding regions, which are shown in pink. So once the antibody sequence has been slotted in, it's transferred into a bacterial cell, and this is where phage display comes in. We introduce a bacteriophage or phage that attaches itself to the bacterium, deposits it, its uh, genetic material, and reproduces itself. But of course, we've added new information into this vector. And in reproducing itself, the phage replicates this genetic material as well as, as well as its own. When its progeny are created with their gene 3 phage coat proteins, the antibodies are attached. Um, of course, this is happening millions of times. We didn't just make one vector, we made millions, all with unique hypervariable binding regions. And we transferred them all into bacterial cells. Then we introduced the phage, and now they're all carrying a unique antibody attached to their coat proteins, and this is our library. Basically, we're adopting the same principles evolved by nature by creating enormous diversity or creating actual antibody structures with up to six binding regions. Once we have our antibody displayed on the coat protein of the phage, uh, progeny, we allow the antibodies to do what they would do in vivo. Each one of those billion antibodies has unique specificity for one target. In vivo, antibodies survey the body looking for threats to neutralize. So in a process called panning, we introduce our library to um, a target of interest and allow the antibodies with a complementary binding site to find and um, bind to the target. At this point, we have total control over the conditions, so we can manipulate them to find uh, the antibody of choice, i.e. we can look for uh, antibodies stable at extreme pH, or we can rule out closely related targets by excluding binders with dual specificity, um, that's by subtractive panning, and so forth. Um, of course, we can also select antibodies against the 
toxic um, antigens um, or those that are immunogenic or pathogenic and you couldn't do this in vivo. Or as another process adopted from nature, you have affinity maturation where the genetic code is slightly tweaked and uh, selected again through panning until an antibody with the desired qualities are found. Now I've briefly explained three ways of making antibodies. Um, it's important to note that as well as using human donor antibody genes, these can also be extracted from the serum or spleen of immunized animals. So just because an antibody in a catalogue is described as recombinant, it doesn't mean that it is an AFA. It's important to be aware of this. Immunized or animal-derived recombinant antibodies uh, that are also sequence defined, and so they have the same benefit of unlimited reproducibility that Sanafa does. However, it's a costly and time-consuming process where there's no net reduction in animal use. Because the animal immune system is still being relied upon, a new library has to be created for each new antigen, and they can still suffer the same issues as, as hybridomas. So be warned. It can be difficult to identify this in catalogues. You may think you're buying an AFA when the source is in fact animal de uh, derived. It's important therefore to find out if the antibody is selected from a universal or naive library rather than an immunized one. Or the gene may simply have been transferred from a hybridoma. Some companies are doing this with a backlog of hybridomas. And uh, as antibodies uh, producers may get their antibodies from multiple sources, this can be confusing. So, how does this lead to a better science? Well, recombinant antibodies, regardless of whether they are animal-derived or AFAs, uh, have the advantage of unlimited reproducibility. So here, I'm talking about advantages that are unique to AFAs. So you can pre-design your libraries with all the features you desire, so that every antibody in that library shares these features. Antibody selection is quick, normally under four weeks, and you may be panning multiple targets, not just one at a time. The gene is always available, so you have these opportunities for further refinement if after analysis of the binding characteristics of your selected antibodies, you decide that you want it, such as affinity maturation, format changes, challenging panning conditions, or next generation sequencing. So this would take a little longer than four weeks. One library is equivalent to a lifetime supply of animals. So that means once your library is constructed and well characterized, you'll always have it. No animal housing needs or handling and no more suffering the shortcomings of polyclonals and monoclonals. AFAs are routinely sequence defined from the start, whereas polyclonals are not sequence defined and hybridomas can be, but with additional effort. And you can always guarantee the reproducibility of your scientific results. No batch to batch variation, no irretrievable loss of clone, and no expensive storage conditions. It is important to note that certain scientific limitations that are common to both animal derived and AFAs exist, and that's due to the complexity of the natural antibody antigen binding relationship. Although panning can rule out some of these interactions. For example, antigens pre uh, presented in their folded or unfolded state react differently. Closely related epitopes in unrelated proteins may be recognized by the same antibody, or there may be fortuitous interactions, um, which would be a lack of specificity. Also, where multiple epitope recognition or signal amplification is desired, AFAs can fulfill this role. Imagine, if you will, the advantages of multiple epitope recognition that you get with polyclonal antibodies, but without having to accept the compromises of high background, lack of specificity, cross-reactivity, and batch-to-batch -batch variation. During panning of the phage display library, a scientist will select not just one target, but many. This number varies with each antigen and the conditions employed. So multiple binders can be selected and can be used individually or as a cocktail. 
There are, for example, multiclonals offered by one company. For approaches where polyclonals have historically been relied upon, such as uh, scorpion venom neutralization, it is also possible to neutralize the closely related toxins by using a monoclonal approach using AFAS. Here, I have also highlighted the example of the diphtheria antitoxin where AFAS have replaced horse serum. So to the all important question of why we are not already using replacement methods. Um, so you can look at the non-technical summaries which are made available by each member state and available on the EU website. Here, applicants are required to comment in the 3R section of each project application. And from this, it's possible to see how scientific misconceptions block the uptake of replacement methods. Commonly, it's commented that the technology is not yet mature and ready to replace animals, and the affinity is poor. But in fact, there are a number of examples of EU and US stroke NIH funded projects that have created hundreds of thousands of AFA clones against thousands of antigens. So there are no shortage of examples of their successful generation. Additionally, this technology is well established in the therapeutics industry, although at this stage it's not used exclusively. So this is a misconception, although in the hands of personnel who are not competent in the technology, or if a good library has not been constructed, or if the panning methodology is not well designed, then of course you could encounter such issues. A loss of polyclonal characteristics is, all, is also given as a reason, but I've already shown you how AFAs excel in this area. It is true that there's a lack of understanding of this new sophisticated technology. It's shrouded in mystery, in fact. So it's important to break down this barrier through education and training. So a hands-on practical experience is best. And there, there is clearly a lack of expertise or motivation by users of traditional methods and a propensity towards familiar methods due to the economic and time investment required for implementation. But it is important to invest time in order to save time later on. Up until now, there's been a focus on therapeutics with its high prices and royalties, which is immensely off-putting, commercially speaking. Then finally, end-user accessibility to commercial AFAs has been limited, but this is improving and it will continue to improve as demand increases. So there are now a growing number of suppliers which should continue to improve. If you search the web for AFAS, I would say keep your wits about you because there are those claiming to be animal free, which is a very loose term and um, they're not. <laughs> These here do supply animal free options, although some of them may well also supply animal derived options. The University of Geneva facility will custom supply AFAS at a very reasonable price of about 2000 euro but these can only be used for research purposes. And then there is this IPI project, which I've only recently uh, heard about, but they are soliciting nominations of target proteins and protein families for antibody discovery campaigns. So it could be worth getting in touch with them for your antibody needs. And then here we have catalog supplies of AFAs. And with that, I will finish and say thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this overview of replacements for the use of animal-derived antibodies. Thank you, Alison. As a reminder, we're going to hold all questions until the end, but please send them in at any time using the GoToWebinar questions panel, and we'll ask them after our next presentation. Speaking next will be Dr. Jao Barroso. As a scientific officer at Eurolecnam, Dr. Barroso coordinates the validation of non-animal methods and approaches for global regulatory use, including the identification and assessment of promising methodologies for regulatory and biomedical applications and their translation into EU legislation and international standards. Zhao also coordinates the ESAC, a scientific advisory committee responsible for conducting independent reviews on non-animal methods and approaches at the request of Eurolecnam.
as well as issuing uh, ural ECBAN recommendations on the basis of ESAC opinions. Zhao also serves as the Vice President of the European Society of Toxicology in vitro. Thank you, Catherine, for your kind introduction. And thank you also for inviting me to give this webinar today. I will present a review of the scientific validity of non-animal-derived antibodies that ESAC, uh, our scientific advisory committee, conducted and the recommendation that we issued on the basis of the advice we received from the ESAC. Antibodies are amongst the most commonly used reagents in research, and they are also used in diagnostics, therapeutics, and for regulatory application. Because the majority of the antibodies used in research are undefined reagents that are many times impossible to reproduce, they have been identified as one of the possible culprits of the lack of reproducibility of science. Recent publications by Monica Baker in Nature have, in fact, implicated animal-derived antibodies in the, in the lack of reproducibility of science. And there are, there are many other examples, uh, as shown by Allison. In 1998, based on the available evidence, the ECRAM Scientific Advisory Committee concluded that scientifically acceptable in vitro methods for monoclonal antibody production were practically available, and that these methods, namely the use of hybridomas, were either better than or equal to the in vivo assays production method in terms of antibody quality. Thus, the ESAC stated in 1998 that in vivo production of monoclonal antibodies by the assays method was no longer scientifically necessary, except in very rare cases. Nevertheless, the recent statistics published by the European Commission on the use of animals for scientific purposes in the EU show an increase by 65% in the use of the mouse assay method for monoclonal antibody production between 2015 and 2017. And this is considered to be a severe procedure. Although these statistics do not indicate the total number of animals used for generation and production of antibodies beyond the assay method, it is well known that animal immunization is still widely used for the development of monoclonal antibodies and the production of polyclonal antibodies. And this despite the availability of alternative technologies that do not entail the use of animals, as we have just seen from Alison's presentation. Importantly, the EU Directive 2010-63 on the protection of animals used for scientific purposes does not allow the use of animal-based methods when valid alternatives exist. For these reasons, ECLAM decided to request its scientific advisory committee, uh, the ESAC, to review the scientific validity of non-animal-derived antibodies, and in particular of those generated by display of combinatorial antibody gene libraries, as replacements to traditional antibodies. For this purpose, we convened an ESAC working group with some of the best experts in the field who met at the JRC on 8-9 November 2018 to review the available evidence and produce a report. The working group was composed of eight out of a total of 15 ESAC members, and Allison, who you just heard before me, was on one of the experts in the working group. The experts in the working group covered expertise in antibody generation with animal and non-animal technology, antibody engineering, antibody use in many research applications, including diagnostics, therapeutics, and research, and they were from both academia and industry. The final opinion on the subject matter was endorsed by the ESAC in plenary on the 4th of June last year. I would like to stress here that the appointment of experts serving in, the, in commission expert groups, such as the ESAC, follows a very rigorous process. All selected experts need to submit declarations of interest, which are analyzed by the two coordinators and the legal services of the commission to identify potential conflicts of interest. Only experts deemed to have no conflict of interest in relation to the charge question of the expert group can be appointed. Those BOIs are publicly available in a register that was set up by the Commission to ensure full transparency. The link to the register is available on this slide. Also worth uh, mentioning is that the reports produced by the ESAC working groups are always peer reviewed by the whole ESAC before publication. In the case of this specific review, and as I mentioned in my previous slide, the working group was composed of eight out of 15 ESAC members, and their report was peer-reviewed by the remaining seven members of the ESAC. The final opinion was drafted and endorsed by the whole ESAC in plenary. 
So what was the charge question for this review? We asked the ASAC to review the available proof of the scientific validity of antibodies and non-antibody affinity reagents used in research, diagnostics, and regulatory applications generated using animal-free technology. The ASAC was not requested to address the use of antibodies in therapeutics due to some potential conflicts of interest of some of its members. The ASAC decided to focus their review on non-animal derived antibodies produced by phage display because they are leading in respect of technological maturation and compatibility to the usual scientific application. They have large bodies of evidence supporting their use. They have been used in a broad range of applications and they have the fewest perceived hurdles to rapid implementation. But the field is rapidly developing and diversifying, and therefore it was noted that there would be value in convening a separate review of non-antibody affinity reagents as replacements for animal-derived antibodies at a later date. In June 2019, after finalizing its review, the ASAC concluded that non-animal-derived antibodies are mature reagents generated by a proven technology they have no general or systematic disadvantages with respect to affinity, stability, shelf life, and specificity. And they can be used in all typical immune analysis applications, such as Western blotting, immunohistochemistry, flow cytometry, et cetera. Non-animal derived antibodies offer significant additional scientific and economic benefits. As Allison mentioned, the knowledge of the sequence provides a unique identifier, as well as unlimited and sustainable supply. Moreover, phage display technology allows the guided selection of essential properties, such as specificity, compatibility to certain assay conditions, cross-reactivity, stability, or affinity. Ultimately, non-animal-derived antibodies are better reagents that will improve the reproducibility and relevance of scientific procedures and will lead to more efficient and effective use of research funds. Finally, the ASAC also stated that non-animal-derived antibodies should be promoted in order to increase their development and use. There is a clear lack of awareness in the scientific community that leads to many scientific misconceptions, and therefore, education is needed. So, on the basis of all the available evidence and their own experience, the ASAC members concluded that non-animal-derived antibodies are able to replace animal-derived antibodies in the vast majority of applications. Moreover, well-characterized recombinant affinity reagents will improve the reproducibility of science and positively impact society. On the basis of the ASAC opinion, ECLAM issued its own recommendation that animals should no longer be used for the development and production of antibodies for research, regulatory, diagnostic, and therapeutic applications. Even though the ESAC review did not cover therapeutic applications, ECLON considers that non-animal-derived antibodies are also a suitable alter alternative in this field. The provisions of Directive 2010-63 should be respected, and new countries should no longer authorize the development and production of antibodies through animal immunization, where a robust and legitimate scientific justification is lacking. It is important to note here that all recommendations underwent consultation and commenting by other Commission policy DGs and EU agencies, by PARERE, which is our network of national regulators from EU member countries, by ESTAF, our non-governmental stakeholder forum, and by ICATEM, which is the International Cooperation on Alternative Methods with representation of governmental institutions from the US, Canada, Japan, South Korea, Brazil, and China. These various networks were able to provide scientific, technical, and regulatory input on the recommendation before its publication. As Alison alluded in her presentation, there are many misconceptions in the scientific community about the quality and validity of non-animal-derived antibodies, which were thoroughly discussed by the ESAC in their report. We have tried to break down some of these misconceptions in our recommendation. Non-animal-derived antibodies are available from catalogs as research reagents and are generated as commercial service, although the current commercial availability is still much lower than for animal-derived antibodies. There is an abundance of scientific literature describing various approaches for generating non-animal-derived antibodies. For example, building of universal recombinant antibody gene libraries, antigen selection and production. 
Non-animal-derived antibodies can be stably produced in unlimited amounts, as the example of the proof therapeutic shows. They are equivalent to animal-derived antibodies for the vast majority of applications and can actually offer uh, significant scientific advantages. To date, most of the recombinant antibody gene libraries have been built using human antibody sequences as a blueprint. However, there are no known limits concerning the choice of the species for building such libraries. Only standard labor laboratory equipment and consumables are needed for generating non-animal derived antibodies. Laboratories familiar with modern molecular cell and microbiology techniques should be able to generate non-animal derived antibodies once adequately trained. Development of a universal recombinant library requires a significant time investment, ranging from a few months to a couple of years, which depends on the approach used, level of expertise and quality control. However, uh, as Allison mentioned, once a library is developed, it supplies a diversity of antibody candidates equivalent to a lifetime supply of animals and removes any ongoing cost of animal care where relevant. There is also significant benefit in time because the selection of antibodies using the universal recombinant library can be performed in a few weeks, while the generation of animal-derived monoclonal antibodies needs several months. In terms of budget, the cost of generating non-animal-derived antibodies are comparable to those of generating monoclonal antibodies by immunization. More importantly, the financial impact of producing animal-derived antibodies of questionable quality and using them in research to obtain results that are potentially meaningless is high and far exceeds the cost of generating well-defined non-animal-derived affinity reagents. Two of the ESAC working group members, Andrew Bradbury and Andreas uh, Plutkin, estimated in a publication in Nature in 2015 that many hundreds of millions of dollars are inadvertently spent annually by the biomedical research community on non-specific and badly defined animal-derived antibodies. Moreover, significant losses are also being incurred as a consequence through associated waste of time and resources and the follow-up of potentially misleading research results. There are many scientific advantages of non-animal-derived antibodies, as already mentioned by Allison. To name just a few, non-animal-derived antibodies are sequence-defined, while polyclonals are not, and monoclonal hybridomas are only sequence-defined with additional effort, which is barely done. Polyclonal antibodies represent the largest fraction of commercial antibody reagents. They are characterized by multiple epitope recognition, often have high affinity against the target antigen, offer good sensitivity, are inexpensive, and are quick to produce. However, they suffer issues of batch-to-batch -batch, batch variation, low specificity, and high detection background. Monoclonal antibodies from hybridomas, on the other hand, are in principle characterized by single epitope recognition, and are thought to bind with high specificity to only one unique epitope. However, many monoclonal antibodies used in research were found to still cross-react with other molecules, like uh, Alison mentioned. Uh, in fact, a recent study by Andrew Bradbury, Stephen Duvel, and others has shown that almost a third of randomly chosen hybrid omens uh, contain one or more additional productive heavy or light chains that interfere with specificity and or sensitivity of the antibody. In addition, hybrid oma clones can die off and be lost. In contrast, because they are sequence defined, Non-animal-derived antibodies can be, be duplicated with identical binding and specificity profiles. The in vitro antibody selection against target antigen can be tightly controlled to enrich clones with desired properties. For example, one can do the affinity selection with the exact biochemical condition under which the antibody will be used afterwards, and therefore select only antibodies that are functional at these conditions. The genetic sequence can be modified to have a multitude of features, including a variety of antibody formats and detection systems. So, how can we promote the generation and use of non-animal-derived antibodies? Well, first, through education and training initiatives targeted to the various stakeholders, such as end users, suppliers, funders, ethical review bodies and publishers, using webinars such as this series, e-learning courses and hands-on training where necessary. There needs to be further awareness 
raising, uh, awareness raising and dissemination of information on the availability, cost, and scientific benefits of non-animal derived antibodies. As an example, I've included in this slide a link to a short video from BioRed that nicely explains how they use phage display to generate custom antibodies for their clients. Second, projects requesting authorization to use animals in EU for the development and production of antibodies should systematically be challenged in line with Articles 4 and 13 of Directive 2010-63 EU and rejected by the authorizing bodies and ethical committees when robust legitimate scientific justification is lacking. Finally, Increasing funding opportunities to scientists using non-animal derived affinity reagents will help promote a transition in the scientific community. Moreover, funding should also be made available to fully characterize the thousands of non-animal derived affinity reagents generated in EU and US NIH funded programs and make them available to scientists. And finally, what should the various stakeholders do? Manufacturers and suppliers should establish a rapid phasing out time scale for the use of animals to generate and produce antibodies and replace the animal derived antibodies available in their catalogs by non animal derived affinity reagents so that commercial availability increases. Existing hybridomas that have been sequenced and are well characterized may continue to be used to produce recombinant monoclonal antibodies in vitro since animals are no longer required. Importantly, antibody catalogs should unambiguously uh, show whether the antibodies are animal derived or not. End users should search for and specifically request well-defined non-animal derived affinity reagents from suppliers to address their research or regulatory questions. A higher demand will increase the production and eventually decrease the costs. Academic institutions should try to coordinate efforts to develop non-animal derived universal recombinant libraries and establish development and production services to support research activities. Last but not least, editors, reviewers, and publishers, publishers of scientific journals should demand higher quality in antibody-based research, strive for increased scientific standards, and adopt unified validation standards for affinity reagents used in their publications. Applying stricter journal policies would further accelerate the transition towards the use of non-animal derived antibodies by the scientific community. So I'll just leave it at that. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Joao, and thank you again, Alison, for two very interesting and inform informative presentations. Um, it's certainly exciting to see the momentum of these reagents moving towards policy implications and their more widespread implementation. Um, so we now have uh, some time to uh, ask, the, ask questions of the speakers. Again, I'll ask that you use the Q&A function and the um, GoToMeeting toolbar. We do have quite a few questions and we'll, we'll try to get through um, each and every one. So with that said, um, I think the first question is probably directed to Allison. Um, are there commercially available libraries available along with good protocols to screen for good AFAs against my protein of interest? Yeah, um, I'd say at the moment that's not an easy thing um, to obtain, um, not for commercial purposes. Um, I mean, there are people that supply them. I'm not sure of the cost, but I imagine that they are high um, for commercial purposes. Um, for research purposes, that's a lot easier uh, because there's a number of um, scientists that are willing to, um, shall we say, loan out their phase display libraries. Obviously, there's there will be a sort of a, some kind of agreement to sign to make sure it's used appropriately. Um, but yeah, there are there are people that can supply those kinds of libraries, and there's work going on in this area to try and improve that situation at the moment. Um, yeah, I think that's all I can say at the moment on that point. Okay, great, Alison. And and one other specific question for you: you mentioned uh, the figure of about a million animals per year yeah. um, that are used in Europe. Um, do, do you have a citation or, or a, a, a source yeah. for where that figure came from? Um, no, uh, that that's um, it's very very difficult to find that information because um, the 
the technical summaries, if you like, or the, sorry, the European statistics used to supply certain information on the uh, numbers of animals that are used, uh, but they stopped doing that in about 2013. And then uh, there was only a few countries that were actually supplying that information. So we had a little bit of an idea from that, but the way to do it was to painstakingly go through um, all the commercial uh, suppliers of antibodies um, that have their basis in Europe and uh, apply certain calculations um, that were very conservative but um, you know it was based on uh, the number of animals you would use in a typical application, um, uh, average lifespan of a company and uh, the number of antibodies that are actually produced. Um, obviously this wouldn't take into account import um, from other countries, uh, that kind of thing. But yeah, that was the most conservative estimate that we could find. Uh, I think more likely it's going to be higher than that. Great, thanks, Alison. Um, okay, I believe this would be a question for Joao. Uh, why can we not mandate and rigorously enforce the use of non-animal derived antibodies instead of only recommending their use? So, I mean, the Directive 2010-63 um, does not impose a ban. Um, it, it, it's a legislation um, that should be followed and, and should be monitored by, by member countries. So, at the moment, the Commission is not um, in place to, to establish a ban, and it, that's not our uh, purpose with, with the recommendation. Um, however, um, the Directive should be followed and we will monitor member countries and, and member country, country authorities um, in, in, in the implementation of, of this recommendation. Um, the, 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 thing, the, mo the most important thing is that so far, the justifications we, we've seen are many times uh, incorrect. They are, as mentioned in the presentation, due to misconceptions. Um, we feel that many times the justifications are maybe more economical than, than actually scientific. Um, however, the directive doesn't say that economical factors should should lead to, to the to, to the use of animals instead of, of alternative approaches. Um, so I think the important thing is that um, where there is um, there is a request to use animals, um, there should be a proper scientific justification, and this should be thoroughly evaluated by by competent authorities. So that, that that's what we try to achieve, and that's. Um, what we're telling uh, member countries in the in the meetings we've had so far, um, and and that's 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 the position we're taking. Um, but from the Commission, there will be no ban uh, on this for the time being. Okay, thanks, Joao. Um, and another question for for either you or Allison, I suppose. Um, could you give us an example of a robust scientific justification to use animal-derived antibody? Well, I can say that, and Alison can maybe um, complement this afterwards. I mean, during the ESAC review, um, at least the experts uh, in the panel and then the whole ESAC could not uh, see any uh, valid scientific justification from the examples they were uh, aware of. There are limitations, but these limitations are similar uh, with uh, antibodies derived from animal immunization. Of course, that doesn't mean that in certain in a certain application for a certain researcher or company they might might not find a, a proper justification um, we weren't able to identify any during the review uh, but we acknowledge that they may exist um, we just want people to be more clear about them when they request uh, the use of animals for the for developing antibodies i think um my recommendation to um, um, project license authorizers would be to know um, information about the alternative methods that they have used um, and to supply data. Um, I mean, ideally, if they were, um, if they really found that they couldn't supply their antibody by using uh, recombinant methods, phase display uh, methods, ideally these should come from independent sources, for example. Um, yeah, if, if, yes, 
and this would be uh, a last resort, I think. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's all I can remember that I've said for the time being. Okay, great. Thanks both. Um, uh, okay, a, a technical question. Um, it's not clear how you can avoid the need to, for animals to first produce and identify a new or unknown antibody. If you don't know the protein or DNA sequence for your construct, how can you create the vector to be used for APRA production? Could you repeat that question? Sorry. Sure. Uh, it, it's not clear how you can avoid the need for animals to first produce and identify a new unknown antibody. If you don't know the protein or DNA sequence for your construct, how can you create the vector to be used for APRA production? Okay, um, so I think that's a, maybe a misunderstanding of, of what I tried to explain in my talk. Um, because your, your vector comes from known genetic sequence one way or another, either from um, deriving your antibody sequences from human populations of B cells or um, databases are full of genetic sequences <clears throat> and, and the, um, the most commonly used ones have been identified and they're publicly available and you can use those and you can put them into a vector so they're, they are readily available. Um, then your um, binding region is um, hypervariable if it comes from human um, B cells, or you can make it hypervariable yourself by randomizing it using sort of standard methods. And it's through selection that you then identify your um, antibody against your antigen of choice. So in your select in your library, you're going to have um, tens of millions of possible candidate antibodies and one of them will bind to your target and then through panning you um, amplify that particular antibody so once you've done that once you've amplified it and isolated that antibody you can sequence it and find out exactly what that sequence is for future reference so i hope that answers your question yeah great thanks for that clarification allison um, Joao, a, a specific question regarding the ESAC review and the apparent exclusion of the pharmaceutical industry. The, the, the question refers to that point and um, the, the, the reality that that industry likely has the most experience with the generation of non-animal derived antibodies and the potential drawbacks they may have, such as uh, cited as lack of affinity maturation and long timelines for affinity optimization. Limita limitations with regard to antigens, um, such as complex membrane bound targets and so forth. Um, as a consequence, the majority of antibodies developed for therapeutic use are animal derived, and this is unlikely to change. Can you comment on the, the rationale for a pharmaceutical industry rep not being included or clarify that point? And what would be the impact of the recommendation on EU-based companies whose technology is based on isolation of human antibodies from genetically engineered antibodies. So, um, just to clarify, we did not exclude um, experts um, with, with expertise in the therapeutics field. On the contrary, um, several of the experts are actually operating in that field, and that's why um, we did not cover that specific field in the, in the review because of potential conflicts of interest. Um, because obviously, as Alison said, uh, a lot of the people working in this area um, are mostly focused on, on therapeutics because that's where most money is at the moment, because also there is lack of demand from the scientific community. Um, I don't think it's a correct statement to say that um, that non-animal derived antibodies have uh, several flaws that uh, prevent them from being used as therapeutic agents. I think the, the working group report and the review that CSR conducted uh, clearly shows the opposite. I, I also don't think it's uh, correct to say that just because there are more animal derived uh, proof therapeutics than non-animal derived ones that the number shows they are better. Um, well, we, we would have to compare how many people are working with any with animal immunization and transgenic animals uh, and for how many years 
as compared to how, how many scientists are working in, in, with phage display and, and non-animal uh, technologies and for how many years to have a, minimal, a meaningful comparison. But Ellison showed in her presentation several uh, non-animal derived antibodies that are, have been approved as, as therapeutic agents. They are successful. I think um, in the last uh, webinar series, uh, Stefan Duvel and Sashdev Sidhu uh, also presented a lot of work they've been doing on COVID, for instance, COVID-19, and showed a lot of the, the, the advantages actually that you have when uh, using non-animal derived uh, technologies to, to, to produce new therapeutic agents. And I think it would be really worth for the people that haven't watched those to, to, to see the recording. Um, because, you know, th those are clear examples of how the technology works in therapeutics. Um, so just to reiterate what I said in the beginning, we did not exclude expertise. We had expertise. We just did not ask the ASAP to review specifically the field of therapeutics because some of the experts operate in that field. And Alison, I don't know if you want to add something. I honestly think you've covered it all. Hey, great. Thank you, Joao, for that clarification. I'm wondering um, if I can go back um, to the previous question because um, I've managed to find the information I look for now. Would that be sure. okay? Please, please. Yeah. Thank you. So that's regarding what um, project license applicants should demonstrate um, if they are applying for a license. Yes, if you remember that question earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the kind of recommendations that I thought might be useful um, is firstly data that demonstrates that the applicant's own library is adequately characterized even before you start to use it and that it's been validated against the range of targets and that it has adequate diversity and is of a suitable engineered format for uh, its intended application. Um, and then for each new antigen you should show that data show data that the um, library didn't produce candidates using that characterized library. Um, you could involve a troubleshooting scheme uh, that you've used to attempt to resolve the issue. Um, and then, as I said before, that it would be helpful to have supporting information from a, an independent source, from a library that is well established in using these methodologies, because unfortunately it may be the case that you can't, put, sorry, you, the person applying, cannot um, manage to generate antibodies, but I think there are many people who, or many groups that are doing this routinely, um, and they have the expertise. So that's that's what you're up against, really. They can they are most likely to be able to produce your antibody. Uh, yeah. So that's it. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> great. Thank, thanks for that. That's my opinion, anyway. No, that's great. Thanks for revisiting that, Alison. Okay. Um, Okay, another comment uh, related to new versus existing products. So, um, you know, developing a non-animal derived uh, affinity reagent or antibody um, for new products is, you know, perhaps not as challenging as uh, replacing an existing product where an uh, animal derived antibodies are already used and need replacement. How much yeah. consideration? How much consideration was given to that in the the development of the recommendations from the ESAC? So, um, I mean, no, uh, do you want to go first, Alison, or shall oh, I? Oh no, you carry on. <laughs> okay. No, I I think um, from our perspective, uh, for instance, use of the SI method is completely unacceptable and and you know should no longer be used. We acknowledge, though, that um, you know where hybridomas exist, and um, you know the, the immunization has been done already, and uh, the production of the antibodies is fully done in vitro. Um, that you know we're not going to waste it. However, um, it should be it would be important to at least sequence those hybridomas and and characterize them, um, so that we at, can improve at least the quality of the antibodies and have a better characterization of the antibodies. Um, so, you know, um, maybe rather than trying to reproduce those antibodies again in vitro um, through phage display, uh, maybe putting at least some effort in, in correct, better characterizing the hybrid element. Um, but for new antibodies, certainly um, phage display should be, should be used unless there is really scientific reason and reasoning for, for why this does not work. Um, 
um, yeah, I think that's that's it from my side. And Alison, you wanted to add something. Well, I, I would just say that I understand that, I completely understand that uh, it is more difficult when you already have processes in place to have to um, change these. Maybe there's a additional validation that you have to go through or something like that. What would be interesting to know from the, um, the person who asked the question is what particular issues they encounter. It, I think that'd be very useful for us to know. Um, but largely, I think, uh, with regards to polyclonals, Yes, of course, you can't necessarily, it would be very difficult to sequence it and, and to have the sequence available mm -hmm. and to put that into a recombinant vector. Uh, right. So, um, yes, that, that would create more challenges. Yeah, polyclonals are definitely more difficult. So, I, I, my comment was specifically related to monoclonals. Yeah. Um, but obviously, and, and we acknowledge that there will be a, a time and, and money investment to, to produce. Uh, either to replace polyclonals by, mon by a monoclonal, which is possible, or to produce uh, multiclonals, like you mentioned, Alison. Um, uh, we acknowledge that, but on the long term, uh, we think this will be a good investment um, okay. because it, 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 in the end, it will lead to better research um, and probably a lot of savings in, in, in research project funding. Um, that that many times are wasted uh, on trying different antibodies and actually uh, obtaining um, meaningful uh, results. So uh, you know, uh, mi meaningless results. I mean, so uh, you know, um, we still think it's it's worth the investment. It 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 may come as an upfront investment, uh, but it will compensate on the on the medium long term. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple questions that really hit the same general topic of, of practical resources. Yeah, can either of you comment on the approximate pricing for having an AFA, an AFA uh, made commercially? Okay, so um, that depends on who you go to and what purpose you require it. Um, so I can only talk about what I've heard, because uh, obviously you, you'd have to negotiate that price with your, you know, your your supplier. Um, for for catalog supply, if you're just getting something out of the catalog, then that will be around the same price. You shouldn't notice the difference. If you're talking about custom made production, and you need it for research purposes, then my suggestion would be, in fact, that you go to a facility such as the University of Geneva, where they are able to supply them without needing to make any profits. Um, so that's at the price that I quoted before, of about um, 2,000 euro. I've, I've spoken to them about this, and they've talked to me about the capacity that they have, and they, they are happy for me to give this information to you. Um, I also understand from them that if you do require um, that antibody sometime in the future for commercial purposes, that you can get back in touch with them and negotiate that with, you know, with them. Um, obviously, there's always going to be certain um, um, intellectual property type restrictions when you require them for commercial use. And as far as I understand, that's the same if you go to a company such as Biorad. Um, at the moment, I would say, which I'm sure Jao is going to say if I don't say it, at the moment, the price for custom production of um, AFAs is high. Um, you, you might start with a price of about eight or nine thousand uh, euro, but that can range, that can go up um, considerably depending on your requirements. But the idea, obviously, is that as demand increases, then uh, prices will decrease. I also hope that there will be, as we have recommended in the directive, there will be, um, what's the word I use, incentives, uh, what's the word, um, sort of discounts, if you like. Um, I, would, I would push for that so that these uh, resources become um, more accessible for, pe for people to use them. Is that okay, Jao? <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and of course, you know, in 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 research applications, uh, you can start putting some of those of those costs in the in the application. And I we're working internally um, with RTD as well. Um, 
to see how we can provide funding for a generation of non-animal derived antibodies for research projects um, where they are required. So hopefully with more demand, as Alison said, uh, the price will go down. So what was looking for was subsidies, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, uh, sure. Great. Thanks. Thanks both for that um, insight. And, you know, certainly as we um, more and more interest in, in implementation of these types of reagents, hopefully other funding organizations will come forward to, to further um, support um, more readily available reagents. I mean, I also feel that as far as um, grant uh, funders are concerned, that if you're writing an application in research for um, developing a new method and the antibodies are involved, I think if you um, refer to this, uh, uh, the report and uh, what uh, ECVAM is doing here, that I think you would be justified in requesting extra money to cover the cost of um, AFAs. And I, you know, we hope that grant hold, uh, grant, sorry, funders will support that. Okay, great. So uh, another question regarding practical applications. Um, is it possible to generate AFAs aimed specifically for certain applications, particularly something like immunohistochemistry using formalin fixed paraffin embedded materials for AFA selection? The, the questioner comments that often antibody clones are selected using an ELISA and they have a poor chance for working for other things like immunist yeah. chemistry. I think in that situation you would encounter the same uh, troubleshooting <laughs> issues that you would account uh, that you would encounter for antibodies from any source. So it's best um, to. I think maybe panning would have advantages in that you can um, do your panning under challenging conditions. Uh, for example, if you were using a uh, reducing conditions for Western blot so that your uh, your um, uh, antigen would be in linear format or something like that, that would be the best way forward. Um, and uh, formalin fixed samples or something like that, that I think would probably be the most likely um, way to uh, find your uh, candidate antibody. So that would be an advantage over using an antibody because um, from animal sources, because of course, once you've got it, there's little maneuverability there to um, once you have it, you have it, you can't then challenge it. So, um, I, well, not you can, but not in the same way. So, yeah, I hope that panning would provide you with some advantages there. I hope that's clear. Great. Thanks, Alison. Um... Okay, a question for, for both speakers and maybe a general question that you, you perhaps already answered, but I'll ask it. Uh, will the effectiveness of AFAs, AFAs be the same as animal-derived antibodies? That's a very general question. Yeah. I... <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Better, I, I, I suppose. <laughs> Yeah, great. So, I, I don't know what effectiveness means, yeah. but you know, um, I suppose uh, as you know, we've tried to, to show um, these antibodies are uh, char characterized many times with uh, better specificity, lower background, um, and you know, you can achieve the types of sensitivities you would expect or you want for for your uh, for your application. So I. You know, certainly, I think um, you can achieve the same effectiveness um, or better. Maybe the can can the person who wrote that question maybe um, let us know what they mean by effectiveness in case it has a specific meaning. Okay, I'll certainly watch for an additional question from from that person. Um, in the interim, uh, Joao, this, this might be a, a clarification or, or perhaps restating um, an earlier comment, but uh, could you um, again state the, the rationale of, the, of um, extending the advice to the use of antibodies for therapeutic use? Extending, so uh, extending meaning why we, um, in our recommendation, included therapeutics even though the ESAC did not review that field, I suppose that's the Correct. question. Correct, yes, um, that's right. the way I interpret it too. Mm -hmm. 
So um, from our perspective, um, we couldn't uh, discussing with, with uh, several experts and also during um, the consultations we did on the recommendation before um, issuing it, also with DG Santé and with Emma, um, we couldn't see why um, um, this would not be applicable to therapeutics. Uh, again, uh, we have there the, the caveat that where scientific justification exists, proper scientific justification exists, animals can be used. Um, and we don't exclude the possibility that some pharmaceutical uh, companies have tried for certain types of antibodies or therapeutics, um, non-animal technologies, and they did not succeed. But I think they, they would need to justify that. Now, for the types of, of applications we've seen, we don't see why therapeutics um, would, not, uh, would not require, um, would not fall under the same recommendation. In fact, if we had decided to exclude uh, therapeutics from our recommendation, that could easily then be used as an excuse to, to use animals for therapeutics. Um, so, I mean, uh, there was a, a clear reason why we excluded that from the review. But again, as I say, the experts there have expertise in that field. Um, and, and from what um, we discussed with them and with other uh, external partners and, and networks, um, we couldn't see a reason why, why to exclude this from the recommendation. And therefore, we, we decided to extend it to therapeutics as well. Great. Thank you for that clarification, Joao. Uh, has there been a side-by-side -side comparison between the success rate and quality of antibodies generated with both methods against a large number of various antigens in contrast to just demonstrating that it's possible to generate a non-animal derived antibody on its own? I think that's we've thought we've talked about that we've discussed whether that's worthwhile and I honestly don't think that it is um what is important is to demonstrate that your AFA has specificity certain binding characteristics that it can bind uh at certain concentrations you know as, as low down as picomolar concentrations Doing a side-by-side -side comparison is extremely difficult because those two antibodies will not be against the exact same epitope. Um, and do you know what I mean? So you're never truly making a, a really good scientific comparison there. There will be all sorts of um, factors uh, that get in, into the way of your conclusion. But yes, at the end of the day, why use um, lots and lots of animals uh, to generate new antibodies against a particular peptide or something like that. I, we just don't see that there's that's a good time investment or um, justifies the number of animals we'd have to use to generate them. Um, what we have done, uh, or what we have shown rather, is um, in the appendix of the report, thousands of um, antibodies generated through phage display that have shown those characteristics. And we feel that that's adequate justification for moving to AFAs. Maybe, maybe I add something to this. Um, you have on your screen the next uh, webinar is on the 15th of October. Um, it's true that there haven't been many comparative studies performed uh, for the reasons mentioned by Alison. Uh, but Sharu, um, she will be presenting on the 15th of October, and I'm sure she will present some of her work uh, on exactly comparative studies uh, between animal-derived catalog antibodies and non-animal-derived um, for some of the most uh, used and purchased antibodies, I think one in particular. Um, so, you know, if you're interested in seeing that, at least one example or a couple of them will be presented by Sheru in the next webinar. So mm -hmm. stay tuned. Great, thank you, Joao. And I should have saved that question to the end because that would have been an excellent segue. <laughs> um, uh, in, the, in the meantime, uh, could you please comment on why there are no non-animal derived antibodies used for diagnostic purposes, for example, those used in hospitals? Um, I'm not I sure would... there are none. Yeah. No. Go ahead, Alison. <laughs> No, I'm going to say the same as you. I'm not aware of the current situation um, in terms of the number of animals that are or, uh, animals that are or aren't used specifically for diagnostics. That information is hard to come by for a start. Um, 
I don't imagine there's a specific reason for it other than um, the reasons that we've already um, highlighted. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a very specific question here as we get towards the end of our time. Can you describe the process of affinity maturation using PCR mutagenesis more, please? Can I describe it more? Yeah, yeah. I guess maybe expand on your description or clarify. I'm, I'm not sure. If it... um, well, I mean that that's textbook information that um, should be easy to obtain uh, just by um, okay. going to literature sources. Yeah. There are a number of different techniques that, that you can try, uh, depending on your application, that uh, may or not suffice, but they're all based around the principle of um, uh, mutation type um, strategies. Um, and you have to you choose where whether you want that sort of mutations uh, to occur in the framework regions or in certain CDR regions, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, you have to you have to build a strategy for that. Excellent. Okay. Sorry, well, I'm I, no, 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 I think that's a fair answer for sure. Um, okay, I, I think that brings us to the end of our uh, session. I want to again thank Joao and Allison for for two wonderful presentations yeah. and for uh, staying um, in on a really robust question and answer session. That was really wonderful. Yeah, it's been good. Um, thank really you to everyone. Nice. I'm sorry. There's been some very nice questions. Thank you. Yeah. We, we appreciate this. Very good. So thank you again to everyone for joining today's webinar and again to our speakers. And, and please register for future webinars um, in this ongoing series, which as Joao very nicely pointed out are listed on the slide projected now. So please enjoy the rest of your day. And we'll talk to you on October 15th. Thank you everyone for listening and for attending. Thanks Dave and Catherine. Bye-bye.